this is the second time to speak this this mm. semester. Mm. So we had to get the, the good the good stuff twice. It's also his birthday today. Oh, oh. and he returned as we I guess finally call it sixty years old today. Yeah. And so we're not saying happy birthday right now, but maybe appropriate later afterwards if you want to do that. But so it's his happy birthday and uh, Holy Week Chapel. So let's celebrate God's word and welcome Dr. Mm. Lord. <clears throat> Yeah, this is, um, this is Holy Week. When I was born, 1964, March 27 was also a Good Friday, which is why I was named Christopher, Christ Bear. Uh, maybe prophetic, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where we're at. I'm glad we read uh, Psalm 22 earlier because that's a lot of where we're going to be uh, today, among other places. This is Holy Week, and I, I'm thinking about Holy Week as a whole, you know, and I've, I've got the, uh, I was saying about the three probably uh, strongest points of, of Holy Week, Palm Sunday, and then uh, Thursday night with the Lord's Supper, and of course, uh, Friday. I'm thinking the resurrection's on Sunday, that's the next week, so I put these three as the symbols of, of Holy Week. It, it's interesting because Holy Week is the beginning of the turning point for humanity. Think about it this way. If you go all the way back to, to Genesis, right? Here, here's the story, and it's, I think there's something being told us here. Um, they have this choice. There's a tree in which they're to eat from, and a tree they're not to eat from, right? Well, they could really eat from any tree except the one. But they go daily, if I use the Dr. Blakemore's term, they go sacramentally daily to the tree of life. Now, interestingly enough, when you think about it, if you look at the whole picture, apparently that's the time of day when God himself comes and walks in their midst. Could it be the tree of life is more than just some piece of fruit? It is about sharing life with God, you know. So the decision not to go to that tree is a decision not to share in the life of God. It's a decision to trust something else. And so our story begins in some sense with, um, with a call to a relationship, a union, a uniting with God through this uh, relationship He invites us into. And I find it interesting that He even does that. The God of the universe, the Holy One, makes us able to receive and give love because that is who He is. He is love. And so God makes us for a relationship with Him. However, having chosen not to do that, to disconnect ourselves from the life of God, well, you know, there's, there's a word for that when you disconnect yourself from life. It's death. And as Wesley said, they did die. They, they died the worst of all deaths. They died to God. So <clears throat> choosing something besides God leads us into this place, this death, this separation. We've separated ourselves from God. We're, we're guilty, I suppose, of... Uh, in a legal sense, it would be guilt uh, of breaking that one command he gives. Adam breaks it. And of course, the consequences of that are seen within the human race. When you disconnect the race uh, from God, we could never be what God intended us to be because he intended us to be united to him, living in him and with him. And so he, here, comes our, here comes our change, something uh, different than what God intended. However, the story doesn't end there. And that's the great thing about it. The hope of Easter is the fact that there is something other than what we're stuck with for us. And it's not because of us. We could do nothing to fix this. You know the Anselmic dilemma, it's called, <clears throat> uh, theologically. Uh, Anselm had this little dilemma. You know, it would, it would take a, a man sinned. It would take a perfect man to make uh, a, a redemptive sacrifice, but there are no perfect men, therefore Jesus comes as a perfect man. So I, I want to kind of improve it. I'm a little bit better than Anselm Murray. This you could call the Lorstorfic dilemma. Man sinned, correct, but there's no way a man could ever make redemption for humankind. How could he? Even if he were perfect, he would be what he's supposed to be. So there's no way. There's nothing you can do better than perfect. 
a per, even if there were a perfect sinless man who said, you know what, I'm going to die for the world, and he dies, he's just doing what he's supposed to do in his perfection. Th that has no redemptive value. No, the only person who could redeem us would be God himself. And here's what he does. The same God who gives himself in the Trinity, the same God who gives himself in creation, looks at a human race that's fallen, as St. Athanasius said, was going into nothingness. He, he overrides what would be his righteousness, the righteous anger he maybe should have toward us. It's overridden by his love, and God makes a move to do something about our redemption. That's the story of Holy Week. That's what you see happening right there. God becomes man, takes on humanity, not because it takes a man to redeem us, but he comes because it's humanity that's lost. He takes humanity to himself. He unites himself <clears throat> to humanity in Jesus. And then he lives our life. He dies our death. He, he has no curse upon him. There's no consequence of death on him. He takes it. Why? Because he's taking on the race. And our race did have a consequence of death. <clears throat> so when he dies, we die. But of course, Holy Week is followed <laughs> by Easter. And when he resurrects, who resurrects? If we die with him, this is maybe Gregory Nazianzen said this in his Easter or oration, Yesterday we died with him. Today we rise with him. Humanity rises with Jesus. Now it's not done yet because what he came to do was to bring a new covenant. It's interesting. Somebody that I know online this other day said, you know, with Holy Week, we ought to be asking ourselves, am I truly a Christian? So far so good. They asked then, what is a Christian? It's someone who knows the teachings of Jesus, who keeps the Ten Commandments, and follows the Sermon on the Mount. I was like, wow, that sounds like the Old Covenant to me. Jesus came, I mean, he said that about his own blood, right? This is the blood of the New Covenant. The author of Hebrews, he came to bring a better covenant. The one promised in the Old Testament, the New Covenant promised in Jeremiah, Jesus said, I'm coming to do that. I'm coming to baptize you with the Spirit, which is that New Covenant. Why? Why? Because Jesus, we die with him in his death. Our sins are dealt with. Then he resurrects, which points us to a future, an eschatological future of resurrection with him. And he brings that race right back. But what does he do with the race? He then on Pentecost pours out his spirit because God did not make you to be separate from him. He made us to be united with him. Go back to the garden. We're supposed to be united, sharing in the life of God, receiving from him life every day. How does he do that? God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and fills us to be his temple. That's why I say Holy Week is the beginning. Not, it's not the end of it, but it's the beginning of a turning point for human history. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That is the potential for, for humanity. And you think about it. Here, here's Holy Week, kind of wrapped up in one thing. First, it, it starts with Palm Sunday. Um, it's interesting because, as you know, when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, they begin to reflect Psalm 118, right? They kind of quote from it. The Hosanna is, Lord, save us. They're, they're, they're quoting, blessed, uh, you're blessed from the house of the Lord. They start quoting Psalm 118 because they think the king has come. And, of course, he was coming, maybe to do something other than what they thought. Uh, in fact, the apostles even later in Acts chapter 1, as he's ascending, they say, are you going to restore the kingdom now? That's exactly what these people are thinking. This, the kingdom will be restored. The Davidic king has come, the one we've been waiting for. He's come. So they start quoting from Psalm 118. What's interesting is that they don't read all of, or they don't quote all of Psalm 118. Because Psalm 118 is where it says, the stone the builders rejected became a cornerstone. The rejection of the Messiah. 
He's not just coming to conquer. Of course, that's why he's coming in on a donkey, of course, because if he came in on a white steed, you know, he'd be a conquering general. He comes in as the Prince of Peace. He's not coming to conquer militarily Jerusalem. He's coming to bring peace through his own death. So they start quoting that Psalm 118. But it says, the, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. And by the way, right after they quote that section, the very next thing says, bind the festival sacrifice uh, to the horns of the altar. Lord, save us. Bind the festival sacrifice to the horns of the altar. They're thinking he's coming to take over, and he's coming to give over, to give his life over for the sacrifice, sacrifice unto God, which is going to be our redemption. That's Palm Sunday. Of course, uh, on Thursday is the Lord's Supper. It's interesting because in that moment, Jesus, I mean, you know, there, there's some there's some application of what he's saying, and there, there's some reality. This is my body demonstrating about what's about to happen. A violent act is about to happen to my body. I'm giving my life for you, he's saying. And yes, the, the grapes had to go through some violence to get to the wine. This is my blood for the new, new covenant. But he does that interesting thing, which is not unlike him, he invites us to participate in that. That's the thing. It's not just him doing something to the side, just like in the garden, just like all along, God says, I'm going to give myself for you. You take that into yourself. You participate in that. Bring that in, not just as something we see memorially, but something that's a, a real a real application of that life. And so even today, he offers himself to us. And when you receive communion, I always say receive. You don't really take communion. You receive it. When you receive communion, you're receiving from him that grace you need right there where you are. Because everybody needs grace. Right there. He wants to meet you right where you are. Of course, the probably the most familiar symbol of Holy Week would be the cross. In fact, I would think the cross is probably the most well-known religious symbol in the world. The other day I saw this video, you know, where this guy was he, was, he debates atheists and stuff. So there's this girl there and he's talking to her and she doesn't believe there's even a God. And he said, wait a minute, you're wearing a cross. And she said, yeah, but I don't see it as a religious symbol. What is it then? It'd be like me, let's say I'm, I walk in here and I got, have a necklace on with a rifle on it. You say, oh, you're a, you're a hunter. I say, no, 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 it's a, it's a symbol for uh, firing squads. You know, I just think about the people all in the line. They've dug a grave. They're all in the line, maybe holding hands. That's just, that's a nice picture. I just love that picture. That's crazy. The cross is not a fashion statement. It's a statement of faith. And so Jesus takes that cross. He goes to that cross. Now, <clears throat> the seven sayings. I want you to think about this. Some people, and I, I suppose, you know, I have no argument for this. Uh, the first three sayings would be done before it turns dark, before, before noon, right? So in his early time on the cross, now, you know, crucifixion, they were professionals at it. They could, they could keep you alive for days. They tortured. I've read some of the things they did. Pretty disgusting stuff I won't mention here. But you can imagine. They had free reign as to what they could do to you, these soldiers. It was fun. They could do all kinds of stuff, and they were good at it. Jesus, however, uh, had taken so much on the front end that he only lasted those six hours. And so the first three hours, I suppose when his head would have been the clearest as to looking around, it's interesting what he does. He looks down, if you think about it from the cross, he looks down and there's the soldiers um, gambling for his clothes. And uh, um, Elijah just read from Psalm 22 where that is said there. And obviously he sees the Jewish leaders uh, shaking their head at him and saying this stuff, all coming right out of Psalm 22. So 
he says, interestingly enough, he thinks about them and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, probably because he's saying, they're fulfilling prophecy and they don't even get it. So he prays for their forgiveness, interestingly enough. Secondly, there's a guy right next to him, you know, the, the two guys who are with him. One of them, you know, saying, well, if you're really something, you could get us down from here. The other one, he started that way, but then he changes it. And he says, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. Then Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now he said paradise. He didn't say heaven. Don't get me started on that discussion. He said, you'll be with me in paradise. It's interesting that he would think about this guy. You're, you're being killed. You've been tortured and you're about to die. And who do you think of? You think of the people who did it, not with revenge or hatred or malice, forgiveness. The guy next to you who, just like the other guy initially, re reviled him as well. Now he's kind of turning that and Jesus says, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. It's okay. And then, of course, he sees his mother. And he says, you know, this is your son, says to John, uh, this is your mother. He wants to make sure she's taken care of. That's interesting. The first three things he does on the cross is about other people, taking care of these other people. It's, it's strange. But now he goes along a little further, and he's getting toward the end, and he's thinking about that Psalm 22. Because, I mean, the, what's right in front of him is Psalm 22 being lived out. So obviously, he would think of Psalm 22, which, by the way, absolutely describes crucifixion. You know, they pierced my hands and my feet. All this, uh, the way he feels physically, all that's in Psalm 22. So his mind is on Psalm 22. So what's he do? He starts quoting Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you... That's how it starts. Now, there's always this theological debate. And I see it sometimes written... And it, I just got to tell you, there's some theological issues with the way it's presented sometimes. Some people believe that on the cross, Jesus, somehow our sins were applied to him in such a way that God the Father turned his back on him. And he's saying that he is actually cut off from God the Father. Theologically, that, that can't happen. If the Trinity is real, you cannot separate between the three persons of the Trinity. However, I will tell you this, the night before, he said, Lord, if there's any way, this is his human his humanness now is dictating some fear. And he says, Lord, if there's any way, remove this cup from me. But then, of course, he said, not my will, but your will be done. The difference between Adam in the garden and Jesus in the garden. Adam said, not your will, but my will be done. Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. And here he is now, and that's a great recapitulation of human experience here. Here he is praying for God to deliver him, and no deliverance comes. And so you think, well, is that because God turned his back on him? I've heard this, you know, it became dark because God turns his back on him. No, Psalm 22 is not a psalm about how God does not deliver you. Right? He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? I crowd to you by day, but you do not answer me. By night, yet I have no rest. But... There's the but, but you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you, they trusted, and you rescued them. This is not a psalm about God not delivering Israel. It's a psalm saying he does deliver Israel. This is a psalm, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually trusting in God for deliverance. Not saying God has cut him off. He's saying, I know. I know. I, I, you're not answering my prayer right now, but I know. And listen, sometimes your prayer doesn't get answered right away. God doesn't answer when and how you want it necessarily, but you can trust him anyway. Amen. You may not see it yet. Trust him anyway. That's Jesus on the cross. He does that first out of Psalm 22. And then, of course, out of Psalm 22, he says, I thirst. Now, I, I get it. Psalm 32, uh, sorry, sorry, Psalm 22 does talk about Jesus uh, 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 pr prophetically about the person being thirsty. And Psalm 69 is the prophecy about the fact that they would give him vinegar to drink. But I think probably Psalm 42 is maybe more on the mind of Jesus. 
Because, I mean, he is physically thirsty. Remember, this is a guy who went 40 days in the desert. He knows how to overcome in these moments, and he, he gets that. And so I wonder if he's not thinking about this. And, and, and I'll tell you why I think it. Because in, in John 17, just before he's, he's taken, he says to, to the Father, I want that glory I had with you before when it was just me and you. He's longing for Trinitarian life again. Right? So here he is in the throes of, of this unanswered prayer. And here's Psalm 42, verse 2. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? I think Jesus in that moment is looking for, and don't take it the wrong way, but I, I think he's waiting, looking for that escape. He's not being, the prayer's not being answered. The cup is not being taken away, but he doesn't have to like it. He's saying, when can I appear before God? I'm thirsting for the very presence of God. Now, he was physically thirsty, but maybe the physical thirst made him think about the spiritual thirst. And I, I think he quotes, I think he's quoting when he says that more than anything else. And then, of course, <clears throat> he says, it is finished. Psalm 22 again. Uh, they'll say, it is done. And as you uh, quoted there, it is finished. Maybe is his, maybe is his quoting of Psalm 22. Maybe that's what he's thinking here because Psalm 22 seems to be in his mind. Of course, in Psalm 31, he's, he's, he's heavily uh, in the Psalms because, of course, he said uh, the Scripture, you look at the Scripture thinking you'll find eternal life in them, but they speak of me, he said. Psalm 31, um, <clears throat> verse 5. Into your hand I entrust my spirit. You redeem me, Lord, God of truth. And as he is coming to his end, not only is the redemption part, his, his part of this unanswered cup, you know, he's praying for the cup to be removed, and of course, when it's not, he's saying, yeah, let's, let's go. Let's, uh, I'm ready to be with God. And it is finished. Th that unanswered prayer, the, the cup he's dealing with is now finished, right? It, he's getting past that point of what he was praying to be delivered from. And then, of course, Psalm 31, 5, into your hands I entrust my spirit. It's interesting. Just like in the temptation, Jesus turns to Scripture. Uh, in his time of need, in his, in his struggle, he turns to Scripture, and those things he learned uh, are on his mind. But not just those Scriptures. He is thinking about the people around him, and uh, he's thinking about us. What he's doing on the cross is because of us. It is an exchange. You think about it. God gave Adam his life. Adam said, no thanks. God comes, Jesus comes, takes up our life. He takes up our life, and he gives now through both his death, resurrection, and, and Pentecost, he's now giving us his life back. It's an exchange. I'll take your life. You take my life in the sense of receive my life. That's what he's doing. This is an exchange. The Christian life, what, what does it mean to be truly a Christian? This is not an old covenant answer of keeping the Ten Commandments. It's a new covenant answer of the living God is living in me. That's a, that's a Christian. But it takes an exchange. You can, live, you can live your life or you can live in the life of Jesus. That's the choice. You can live your life or you can live his life. And I know that Paul said in Ephesians 1 and 2, the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead is now at work in us. That same power resurrecting us. He said, you were dead, but through God's love and God's mercy, even to the ungodly, he's given life. Palm, Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday is God's step toward our resurrection. 
Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you for what you've done in demonstrating that love. You demonstrated your love in that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. We were, as Ephesians says, without hope and without God in the world. We didn't make the move. We didn't make the redemption. We can't. You did. And we receive it today in Jesus' name. Amen.